by a new phone. Because he's here. He knows where the bodies are buried. He knows how all the systems really work. Find that guy in the police department, because they all have one too. Sometimes he's me. Right? And, and start talking to him. Say, hey, I've got a company in town. We do this much money. We hire this many people. You know, we're responsible for a lot of income for this city. We're a little bit concerned about ransomware. We're concerned about whatever. Start that conversation. Um, ask for CID or detectives. Bring donuts, and I'm not kidding. Um, it, you get more done by coming in at 9 o'clock with donuts and coffee and saying, okay, let us tell you what our problems are. Let us tell you what we are afraid of when it comes to, like, here are the three worst things that could happen to us. They don't want to know this. They want to hear your worldview. And if you bring donuts, they will sit there. Local chapters of organizations. Um, this one's really good. Uh, the Financial Crimes Investigators, High Tech Crime. <laughs> I love this title. The National Association of Bunko Investigators. Uh, this is still a thing. Also in New York, they still have a rackets squad. I love that. Um, NCFTA, which is an FBI Carnegie Mellon thing, I think. And they're really good at connecting public-private. Um, cyber retail. If you're a retail, the Cyber Intelligence Sharing Center is really, really, really good. You don't have to be a retailer to join. Um, con the federal police agencies probably have a field office near you. Talk to them. Meet that guy. Uh, I've had conversations here with people who have had really good relationships with their local special agents from the FBI. Meet that person. Um, the, again, the FBI is really not good at sharing back. That's not their job. But when you talk to them and tell them, especially if you tell them that you're seeing things, often if you send the FBI some intelligence that we get through the we get it through our Facebook friends in InfoSec. We get it through the mailing list that we're all on. You get something about some hot cyber something, send it to your friend at the FBI. He's not, it's going to be, you're going to be a, a day ahead of their people, and they'll have it and then they'll feel smart. You build up a relationship, you build up trust, that means that you have somebody to call and run things by. Hey, Bob, um, theoretically, <laughs> hypothetically, if I was to have just been hacked, what would I do? It's a great conversation to be able to have. Don't forget the Secret Service uh, and the Marshals. By the way, the Marshals are really good at finding people if you need somebody to find. But Marshals are, if you go onto the U.S. Marshals website and take a look at the stuff they're responsible for, it's insane. They've got, they've got jurisdiction over so much stuff, and some of it is cyber. And they're really good at their jobs. Postal inspectors are the most overlooked, fantastic law enforcement agency. And postal inspectors have this option that they can basically investigate whatever they want. So if you get a postal inspector and you talk to them and they get to know you, incredibly powerful, incredible the reach that they have. Oh, yeah. Bring donuts. It's, I'm not kidding. <laughs> it's really important. Um, make a list serve. I do this in Texas. I mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, I have now just under a thousand people on this list serve. And it is an email list serve. It is unencrypted. It is not classified. And we have 6,000 messages a year from uh, 255 agencies throughout Texas. We are sharing information, and we find almost every day or two there is somebody catching a, a theft group, a uh, burglar in motor vehicle, somebody going around banging, breaking windows and taking stuff out of cars. Multi-jurisdictional crimes that, that no one would know about because we're not all paying attention to everybody else. They need this. It costs me personally about $2,500 a year to run this thing. It is, for me, it gives me, I am now the guy in Dallas-Fort Worth where if you don't know who to call, you call me. Because if I don't know the guy, I know the guy who knows the guy. So I have the biggest list of emails and phone numbers in DFW. So many people know me and trust me as the guy who runs the listserv. If your company were to do this for your local law enforcement and, law, and tell other local law enforcement agencies in your region, even if you're just going to get 10, 15, 20 agencies throughout you know, your metropolitan area, they don't have anything like this. They need it. It's simple, it's easy, and once they start using it, they won't stop. And it just puts you in the middle. Again, it's building trust. So it's something to really think about. Um, oh, <laughs> there's everything I just said. Uh, and, and by the way, we have volunteer list nannies who make sure that people don't break the rules. There's certain, it's not classified, but there's a something called criminal justice information systems, and, and you have to not send certain information on encrypted. We didn't have the ability to make this a siege of secured list, so we just said, okay, everybody don't be an idiot. Here are the rules, and then we have nannies looking at it. We've never had a violation, and I'm really proud of that. 
So, understand the laws that govern cybercrime, understand your penal code, make connections before you need them, uh, be as useful to them as you want them to be to you. They will call you, a lot of times, especially if you work in banking, or social media, or anything where, anything where cops need it, the most common question on my list is how do I send a subpoena to blank? They don't know. They don't know for digital subpoenas. So if you can be that resource, resource and answer the phone when it's not about you, but to help them help somebody else, that's really good. That's something that they really, really like. Um, learn to quantify and articulate your damages, your losses, and be able to map them to specific criminal actions. So when you go in, you're not just being vague. You're being very, very specific, telling them, here's what happened to you, know, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. That's what they want to know. Charts, diagrams, illustrations, make your case literally foolproof. Don't imagine giving it to the cop. Imagine you're giving it directly to the jury. Because that's actually what you are. At the end of the day, every exhibit that you make, every chart, every drawing you make for them will go. Yeah. Don't, don't forget the donuts. Don't forget the donuts. It's really important. Okay, anybody have any questions? And remember, if you do, the good ones, they'll get a book. Yes, sir? What if the crime is, is more immediate, so you don't have the time to go down to the police station? What if it's that you've got something now, and maybe you need someone to come in and bag and tag and, and, and chain of custody? Do you call your local police? You call, I mean, what if it's immediate? Okay, so the question was, what do you do if you have somebody immediate, you need something bag and tag, you need forensics and things like that? Do you call the local police? I don't know of a single law, a local law enforcement agency outside New York City that would be able to actually do that. Um, I, I just don't, and, and I know that unless it's going to be unless it's a quarter million dollars or more, the FBI is not even going to be into you know they'll want to do this by email. I, I think you're actually on your own for that calling in IR services. Now you can actually call the cops and tell them. Here's another group to make friends with the regional the regional computer forensics lab and your regional or your local university has a forensics program. Those people you should make friends with because you can call them and have them bag and tag and do all the things that they need to do, making sure that they're keeping chain of custody, making sure that every person who touches that USB stick, that t touches anything, is going to be able to testify and fill out some, and stand there and say, yes, this is my training, this is how often I've done it, and be everything you do at that moment becomes evidence. So you have to follow that chain of custody all through the entire process. But then you bag it up and tag it and bring it to your local cops. Now, if you've got that relationship with your cops before and you tell them, hey, when we get hacked, we will go to the regional computer forensics lab or we will call Secure Ideas or somebody and get them to come in and do our forensics, but we want you on scene to watch that, they'll probably do it. It's just that they don't want to feel like they're responsible for it because we haven't had the training to do that. You had a question? Yeah, this has been great. Thank you. Thanks. Nice. So supposing like, we all rush back to our office and start dialing the local PD, and then the local PD is like inundated with offers to come and eat donuts. Like, they could spend the next three weeks just doing that. So and they will. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there any scope for doing this at like, uh, we have our InfoSec groups, our local chapters. What if the local chapter was doing this? It's a, that's, that's a common. great idea. So yeah, the, the question if people didn't hear it, um, does everybody now go home and call their, cop, their local clubs and offer them donuts? And, and should you do it through an organized, uh, an organized fashion like you know, like a, like a group, yes. If you can, you should, and, I, and that actually might have a little bit more credibility with the cops as well. You know, we are a group with 614 members and we meet every month and we share, that would be great. Yeah. And if there were a special interest group within my local chapter that was specifically about incident response and they yeah. were all, they all signed up to, when this happens, I'll jump in my car and I'll get there. I have the personal relationship with the cops and I'll, I'll be on hand to be there the year. So you get a book. Every town does need that, and the special interest group to do that is exactly what's needed. The problem is, it's right now we're saying since we, we're making the perfect the enemy of the good, we we have you know well these cops are stupid they can't do anything. Well, if you meet them halfway, they'll actually do quite a bit. They're not going to make it easy for you to be their friend. They're not going to they're going to be very suspicious of you and your group. As I say, it's going to take months. It's not that they're suspicious of you and your group, per se. They're suspicious of having to learn a bunch of stuff. They're suspicious of wasting time, which is zero sum. They're suspicious of getting into trouble by doing something, and this is the, the classic government problem that you get into trouble for doing the right thing. They're always looking for those landmines that are going to come in. They're organizational, cultural, political. They're not technical. They're mainly how they do business. So that's what you just have to be sensitive to as you do it. Make it easy for them. And 
yeah, that, that would be absolutely wonderful. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Um, did you start as uh, a police officer, or were you in InfoSec and then became a cop? It was that. I, I was in information security, and I kind of got sick of having to call people um, and wanted to kick the door myself. And so I, to my wife's great surprise, at age 45, I said I'm going to the police academy, and I found that agency dumb enough to send me. Uh, <laughs> I, I started doing it like that. There's a, there's a number of us in Texas. I know of three of us in Texas. One of them is actually on SWAT now. So he's this like high speed dude, and he's a geek. Um, and there's another guy, Frank uh, Frank Artis, who's, who's in a, another city as a reserve officer. But yeah, I mean, if anybody wants the information about that, I'd be delighted to talk to you about it. Uh, if you if you'd rather kick the door yourself than call somebody to kick the door, it's it's. I don't regret it. I mean, financially, I regret it. Uh, but again, we don't. People don't do this for the money. Any other questions? Okay, I only give away one book. Come on, I gotta give away at least two. Somebody has to have a question. So, yes. So I have a question. It, it, it's not necessarily. It's um. Yeah. Is it possible to get a job with Microsoft and then get a job with Microsoft? Yeah. 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 You have the option to link your debit card or your bank account to PayPal. Is that something you recommend? No. Nope. And, well, I don't recommend linking your debit card to anything or using it for anything. But um, let me say this about PayPal. Part of the reason that I'm speaking about this with the passion that I speak about it is that I'm, I'm, in, a, I'm in a small agency. We're about 65 officers. We have five full-time detectives. I'm, I'm a part-time detective because they can't... They, no, I'm a part-time detective. Um, the, the number one question that I get is not about anything really complicated. It's, Nick, how do I... I've got a fraud victim. She bought a car over Facebook. She paid with PayPal. How do I... How? Just how? Right? Okay, so here's, here are the people where you have to write search warrants. Here's where you have to write subpoenas to get the account information from those so that you can write search warrants to get that information. It, it's regular fraud investigations, but every crime scene is now a digital crime scene. And every crime scene has some kind of cyber element to it. And so cops have to start learning this. And so PayPal becomes something where it just every single day we're sending it off. And it's that big through it. It's PayPal, uh, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Bank of America, Chase. That's, that's who we're sending this, these subpoenas off. And um, to a lesser extent, for, for me and child porn, it's Kick and Tumblr and, and other places like that. But mainly it's trying to track down financial information or, or phone information for people who've been committing crimes in the, in the physical world, but they're leaving digital exhaust, and we have to track it down. And that's where the community can help the cops understand those intersections, because we don't really right now. And that's something that's important culturally that cops start to, to, to get that. I'm sorry if I didn't really answer your no, question. No, that is, that's what I was just wondering, because you said not the, the, the debit card, but you know you can leave your bank account so that it will transfer your money to your bank account or you know, right. withdraw from your bank account. Yes. I've actually done that with some bank accounts. I trust, I do think that PayPal has a really good fraud shop. They're very, very good at that. I think that most of the problems that I see with PayPal is either completely fraudulent transactions or uh, stolen debit cards. The debit card thing is just, they get, they get hit so often, you're going to get your money back if it's a personal account, not if it's a business account. But if it's a personal account, you'll get your money back. But you're out of your money for several days or weeks or however long it is your bank screws you around until they give you your money back. It's just a pain. Why do it? Um, that's kind of what I come down on. Right um, so you got a question? Yeah. So um, I think another thing that I'm kind of confused on is everything you mentioned were like uh, bigger crimes, like somebody's money got stolen or somebody's uh, identity was uh, taken and used. Um, at what point would uh, someone know that this is a that a crime happened? That's a really great question. Okay, and, and so if you didn't hear, the question is, um, how do you know when to call the cops instead of Facebook when somebody's been hacked? How do you know when to call the cops instead of the bank when you've been hacked? The answer is you, you always call both if you have to call anybody. Um, the cops are not going to be able to help you with a lot of your identity theft issues. They're not going to be able to help you with your banks, your credit cards, your online 
social media, the places where your identity is going to propagate online uh, or become used in something else. They're not going to be able to do that. What they're going to be able to do is go back and help. Um, try to investigate to at least see if you can find out who's doing it. I will tell you, often, and it doesn't strike us, we always think of hackers, or me anyway, when I was in InfoSec, I would think of hackers as being somewhere else. They're often in the local area. The, the people who are using uh, who are using cyber techniques that have been um, essentially democratized because the, basically the barrier to entry has dropped down to almost nothing and people can, can use these scams. And they're using a lot of times scams in social engineering with a digital component. Um, a lot of times they're locals, especially with things like tax return refund fraud, um, the, the really common run-of-the-mill garden variety crimes that, that use cyber. So... Actually, your local cops have a good chance of finding them, but that's not a substitute. They're, they're totally different from the other steps that you have to take whenever you get hit by some kind of a cyber crime. Um, I, I hope that made sense. Yes? Uh, do you, would you treat the hackers as like criminals, or would you treat them as like people who are trying to Yeah, no. Like defect, is it? Is it? Does that make it? Does it make it? Does it make it a different kind of crime? Does Procedurally, it it's child? no. It's the same. But it's, I, I'm I'm more afraid of child uh, child identity theft and uh, than than normal identity theft because you often don't find it for years until they start applying for, for college loans. Uh, send me an email, anybody in the room. We have a, a seven point program for fixing it when your identity gets stolen. Hey, that might come in handy these days after you know two days ago. But um. Having to send it off, but it involves, um, it does involve a police report, and it involves the FTC, and it involves uh, even reaching out to Social Security if it gets too bad. Um, but there, there's a number of different steps that you have to take, and they're important because it, it helps you fix it faster. My sister got hit with identity theft a few years ago. It took her like four years to get it fixed. It's still not really fixed, and it's the fastest growing crime, and the numbers are just absolutely huge of people who get hit by it. But it does, it, it's not. Not in Texas. Okay. I don't know about it here. Yeah, but it's a, it's a good question. Oh yes, one more. I was just going to ask, what are your thoughts on the Equifax? <laughs> um, so and yes, we only have two minutes. <laughs> yes, I, I think you even have less than two minutes. But uh, my my particular thoughts are, uh, what a great what a great publicity exercise um, for for them. What. Bastards! What unbelievable bastards! I mean, I've always not trusted them because their security has always been sort of short shrift. Um, but the the way they responded to it was so awful in, in almost every way and abusive in almost every way and trying to protect themselves and not protect their customers. Um, and now blaming <laughs> blaming open source software and saying, "Oh yes, it was that," as opposed to you know my team of people who configured it um, is is just horrible. I guess what what bothers me about it is that people. <coughs> More people are going to listen to them when they say soothing words than I think we as a community should allow to happen. And I'm really happy that a lot of people are speaking up because when Equifax says something, they're, they're big enough that people will take some comfort when they say, well, you know, the good news is, is that we didn't get, you know, they didn't actually take your credit cards. They just took everything else. Uh, and people would not think through that. Um, that's, that's the only thought that I have right now. Well, and, and people who don't use electronic banking their identities at risk with this. Yeah. It doesn't I mean, matter if you It doesn't matter if you've bought yourself. anything in the last 20 years or so, you're probably in that database. So, yes, it's, they yeah. actually have a website or a link you can go to for their website. Yeah, Equifax Security 2017. Six digits of your thing to say Andrew whether or not you've been yes. your last name and your last six digits to see whether or not you've been compromised. Give me your PII to tell, you me, may to, may tell me if you've lost and it. And then, if yeah, so, we'll click here and we'll sign you up for this thing. And I did it just to see if it that you may be and click up and sign up for it with somebody else that they read the fine print and it says if you sign up for their little service to protect whatever you've given you up your rights to sue. So they've clarified today that that's not their case that, that that's not the case, but it was right that everybody grabbed it. I'm more concerned right now about the I think <coughs> yesterday I saw that there were about 30 sound alike URLs that are being used by fishers to get people 
Um, if, and you know, Equifax Security 2017 with an O, not a zero in the 20. Uh, it's really, really difficult, and people have to be very careful. I have time for one more. So, so what do you think the guidance is for it that we should be telling people? Should we tell them to just freeze their credit? Yes. And not, not sign up for tell them to freeze their credit. That's the first thing. And let's let the let's let the crazy blow over while your credit's frozen. If you don't have to buy a house tomorrow or a car tomorrow, it won't really hurt you, but it'll help you to, to let see how this shakes out and then you're not giving up any of, of your rights. I'm sorry, one more. Just um, a comment on that. So I saw the advice to freeze your credit, and just for a read, um, it's on the Federal Credit Commission website. It's got instructions on how to freeze your credit. It costs you to a small amount to freeze your credit, and then you have to pay to get it lifted, but that protects you indefinitely for the day of it's ten dollars per agency to, to freeze your credit and twelve to unfreeze it, and you can you unfreeze it for like thirty days to get your credit right. out there to the banks. And then I would not worry again. about that money, and I bet you'd get it back it's ultimately. Not, I would think because of the Equifax breach, because you're going to <laughs> say there was a breach that that's. I, I think you can get the credit freeze without having. And on that rabbit hole, I will say thank you all very, very much. My email's here, and I'm happy to have some questions.